in order to accurately understand the, this, this crisis of over-incarceration, we have to uh, recognize uh, the extent to which uh, you know, racism is thoroughly embedded within the system. And Islamophobia, particularly since 9-11, uh, 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 which has uh, become uh, one of the uh, uh, new ways of driving a racism in a militaristic uh, direction, racism repression. Um, and of course, we can't call for an end to uh, racism without calling for an end to anti-Semitism, and an end to Islamophobia, and an end to the occupation of Palestine. Whoever was willing to call for justice in South Africa should be willing today to call for justice in Palestine. It seems like Palestine is a new South Africa. And let me wind up. I, I, I've been speaking uh, longer than I was supposed to. <laughs> so let, let me simply say that deep understandings of racist violence, whether we're talking about systemic violence, institutional violence, uh, uh, arm us against the set of solutions. Because what is happening now is that we're being told that we need better police. And we need better prisons. Why cannot we counter with what we really need? Why can we not say we need to reimagine security, which will involve the abolition of policing and imprisonment as we have known it. We say demilitarize the police, and this is definitely not. There's something like you know 300 over 300 million weapons, not counting the military and the police. So why can we not imagine abolishing the institution of the police as we know, and abolishing imprisonment as the dominant mode of punishment? But even if we get that far. We have to recognize that it's not simply a question of negatively abolishing these institutions, but it is a question of imagining and, and building uh, a new world uh, where the needs of human beings are at the center. And of course, we are the only Thank you very much.
thank you, Angela, for coming this evening. It was very, very a wonderful, wonderful experience. Could you ask yourself, why do people self-medicate themselves so much and in such increasing numbers these days? Um. Well, I think that question has to do with uh, a dilemma that I was asking you to uh, reflect on earlier. Uh, and that is to say the relationship between the pharmaceutical industry and the ideological representation of drugs as panaceas and the availability of, of um, of, of street drugs to certain communities uh, who do not have the opportunity to have access to doctors, to psychiatrists, and other doctors who would prescribe uh, uh, psychotropic medication for them. Um, I think that, um, I mean, I don't have uh, a definitive answer to that question, but I think it's certainly a question that we have to uh, reflect on. And that would perhaps uh, also help us to recognize why it is that people are uh, brought under the control of the criminal justice system, oftentimes for engaging in behavior that is harmful uh, to them. But then, of course, there's the question of, of the decriminalization of drugs. And we know that some drugs that have been previously illegal are not nearly as dangerous as pharmaceutical drugs. And of course, I, I, I live in a state where medical marijuana has been legal for a very uh, long time. Uh, uh, and I know that uh, um, uh, some of the most dangerous effects of drugs are from pharma pharmaceuticals, uh, like oxycodone and, 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 and others. Uh, so I think it's really important to try to pull that apart and recognize the ideological uh, uh, content of these assumptions that we are uh, asked not to question. But thank you very much for your question. That's a, definitely a beginning. Good evening, Dr. Davis. Um, my name is Emily. I'm a senior in American Studies and Women's and Gender Studies. And I actually, um, one of my good friends, he graduated last year. He graduated with the same program of American Studies and Women's Studies. He's working in Little Rock right now. And he's a huge fan of yours, and he wishes he could have been here tonight. But he's working for City Year, so he couldn't make it. But he sent me quite a lengthy question okay. for you. So just bear with me while I read this. OK. So over the past several, several years, conversations about intimate partner violence have made their way into dominant discourse. Of course, this did not happen by accident. Conversations it's about uh, intimate, intimate violence. partner yeah. violence. Yeah. Of course, this did not happen by accident. It is the product gen of generations of women fighting to have their voices and their stories heard. However, now that intimate partner violence, violence against women, has been, have been incorporated into a quote, national dialogue. It has become increasingly depoliticized. The intersections of state violence, white supremacist violence, capitalist violence, colonialist violence, and violence against women have been pushed even further into the margins. Is it necessary or even possible to have effective strategies to end violence against women that rely on the state in all of its forms, including police? Should campaigns like the White House's, quote, no more campaign and KFC's recent agreement with the Keene Police Department be vehemently critiqued? How do we cultivate a vision for ending violence against women that drastically decreases its reliance on state actors and state institutions? So basically, how do the forces of state-sanctioned violence and intimate partner violence interact? Also, asking if the state is a reliable source to protect women and its history. If anyone knows Hirsch Rothmel, this was from him, so now you all understand. But that's his question for you. Okay, uh, let, let me see. Where would I begin? Let me, let, me, let me try to be as succinct as possible. Okay. <laughs> uh, by um, uh, pointing out the fact 
that the failure of the uh, state to achieve any uh, perceivable reduction in intimate violence, partner violence, uh, gender violence, over the last 40 years, uh, the failure to achieve by any uh, significant reduction despite all of the work that has been done, despite the proliferation of uh, state agencies and non-state agencies uh, as well, uh, uh, that rely on punishment as the solution to the problem of violence. So I, I would suggest that you ask him to read Beth Ritchie's book, which I, I mentioned. It's um, called a, a Arrested Justice. And it precisely follows uh, the uh, anti-violence movement from its emergence in uh, the late 60s, early 70s, uh, to uh, the present, and discovers that what had first been um, had a radical potential uh, becomes derailed by the assumption that the primary way of addressing gender violence, violence against women, uh, uh, intimate violence, partner violence, is to use the repressive apparatuses of the state. Uh, because in many ways, uh, state violence uh, further complicates intimate violence. Uh, and one can say that uh, you know, probably people who go to prison for engaging in, 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 in violent behavior uh, within their family or within their intimate relationships come out probably even more violent than when they went in. So um, what I would suggest to him is that that is one of the most powerful arguments for abolition. And if we're going to really address the problems that afflict our world, uh, if we're going to address the problem of violence writ large, uh, uh, and we rely on the repressive apparatus of the state to do that, we will probably get nowhere at all. And the assumption that, that, that state apparatuses uh, are the, the, the only place to turn uh, in when we have problems with respect to relations, uh, uh, intimate relations, social relations, has resulted in what um, uh, Niels um, uh, uh, Christen has called a de-skilling of the population. So it means now that we don't know how to deal with conflict except by calling the police. We don't know, and this, of course, leads kids to assume that the only way to deal with conflict is by fighting it out. So, so it seems to me that uh, this, this issue is very broad and very complex, uh, but it is, uh, at, can be at the center of an awareness, uh, a more capacious awareness of what we might have to do in order to uh, end intimate violence as well as to end state violence. Thank you so much. I wasn't a good thing to